Ya hala. Right now we're going to talk about case endings on nouns in Arabic, what we call in Arabic al-i'rab. And you'll notice that i'rab as a word is a mustar that comes from the same jidr as the word for Arabic in Arabic, Arabi, al-arabiyya. It's really no exaggeration to say that al-i'rab means making something into proper Arabic. They have an immense importance when it comes to high literature and high, the, the most lofty expression in Arabic prose. We don't tend to see these markings most of the time in most texts, but they're very important when we're reading poetry, when we are reading classical Arabic literature, certainly when we're reading religious texts and the commentaries on them. The Qur'an without its i'rab is not the Qur'an. The i'rab are considered part of the fundamental message of the book. And also, knowledge of i'rab is considered for native speakers and non-native learners to be a fundamental aspect of literacy in the Arabic language. What I'm going to do now in this whirlwind tour is give you a sort of a summary of the most common situations where we see each case ending. And then I'm going to also have separate videos on each of the case endings where we'll go into some examples in a bit more detail. There are three, and they all have names, some of which you might recognize if you've learned all of the Arabic verb cases in Arabic. We have some similarities in names. Al-marfu'a is our default case. When we have a noun with marfu'a on it, it is typically going to take a dhamma, a single dhamma at the end, if it's a definite noun, or dhamma tanween, two dhammas that give it that un sound. Where we see marfu'a most commonly is kind of in a default position. If there are no other circumstances in the sentence that make our noun have to be a different case ending, it's probably going to be marfua. So that means the subject and predicate of a nominative sentence, a jumla ismiya, what we call the mubtada, and the khabar of a jumla ismiya. And also the subject of a verb. Again, if there are no other factors that make us change the case, the fa'il, the literally the doer of the verb in a jumla fa'liya. Is going to be mubtada. Remember that adjectives always agree with their nouns in terms of definiteness, number, and case. So if we have, if we're talking about a kitab, for example, and we wanted to say a long book, and it were fully vocalized, we would say kitabun tawilun. Adjectives obey the same rules. <coughs> Mansub. Oh, one other thing. You'll notice that marfu'a sort of agrees with the verb, the voweling of verbs that are in marfu'a. Just as they take a dhamma often at the end, that little extra decoration that we don't always read or hear, but that we know exists. Marfu'a on nouns uses the same vowel, so that can be a helpful mnemonic device. Mansub is the same. If we have a verb that's in mansub, often it takes a fatha at the end in the present tense. And a fatha is how we are typically going to mark a mansub noun. Mansub occurs in a couple of different cases. The most common one is probably direct objects, what we call in Arabic the maf'ul bihi. So if I say I ate an apple, an apple is going to be mansub. It's the direct object of the verb 
8. It also is used for adverbs, including adjectives that answer questions like how or why. You already know lots of adverbs that are mansub, um, like ahyanan or daiman, sometimes, always. In Arabic, those are considered adverbs, and they take that fatha tanween ending. Notice, again, that for definite nouns, we only have one fatha, but for indefinite nouns, typically, we're going to have tanween. So it's going to sound like n. One important distinction about mansub for most nouns that are mansub and indefinite, we're going to add an alif as part of the case ending. It's just decorative. We don't pronounce it as a long ah uh, sound. But if I wanted to say, I read a book, for example, I would say, or write more likely, qara'tu kitaban, where the an tells me beyond the shadow of a doubt that the kitab, the book, is the direct object of the verb I read. Similarly to the maf'ul bihi, uh, we're also going to see mansub on the direct object of kana and its sisters. There's a separate video on that. Kana wa akhawatiha. So if kana or one of its sister verbs has a direct object, the khabar, then the khabar is going to be mansub. If I want to say I was a student, I would say kuntu taliban. Where again, this mansub ending is kind of like marking talib as the object of kana. Finally, we have <coughs> majroor. Majroor we most often see in two circumstances. One is after prepositions, which are in Arabic are called huruf al-jar, or in the singular, harf jar. And notice that jar and majroor share a root. So when we say that uh, a noun is majroor, you can almost think of it as being prepositioned. So after fi or ala, there'll be a more complete list in the video on majroor. If we have a noun, it's going to take majroor as a case ending, which is either a single kasra, you're probably noticing a pattern here, definite noun, single kasra, or single fatha, or single dhamma, as the case may be, indefinite noun, double kasra, which is going to sound like in. We're going to add the sound of a noon to the end. We're going to add tanween. So after a preposition is one circumstance, and the other is every word in an idafa but the first one, which is going to take whatever i'rab it would normally. But after the first word of an idafa, بعد أول كلمة في الإضافة All of the other nouns in that idafa are going to take majroor endings and we're going to see that more in the video on majroor. This is a lot, especially when it's presented as one unified system it can seem a little overwhelming, but it may be some comfort that even native speakers of Arabic who go to grammar school speaking their local colloquial dialect, whatever it might be, they work at this. This is not the language of the street or of daily communication. This is the language of formal written communication. So even native speakers do have to put in some time in order to understand this system and in order to kind of calculate which i'rab are correct 
under which circumstances. If you go ask a native speaker, there's a high likelihood that they will commiserate with you. They will sympathize that this is a system that takes some time to understand in its entirety. And yet at the same time, it truly is part of what it means to be an educated speaker of Arabic. Once more, this is not a 100% exhaustive list of all of the circumstances where we're going to see marfu'a, mansub, and majrur case endings. But if you understand all of these circumstances, and you'll have time to absorb them gradually over your study of Arabic, you will have a really solid basis for using Arab accurately in most of the situations that you're going to encounter in modern written contexts.